Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus. I pray we never get tired of singing about it. I pray we never get tired of living our lives to proclaim it. And Lord, today as we gather around your word, um, we need you to remind us of your heart for all those who are still outside of you, those who don't know you. Lord Jesus, I thank you from the cross, our victory is secure. That by the cross we can say along with you that it is finished, that the work is done and that our salvation is secure and we're yours. Our identities are brand new, never to change back. Father, I pray that you would remind us today that the race um, that we're in is not for our salvation, but it's for your glory and for the salvation of those who don't yet know you. So Lord, I thank you for a, a moment to gather together in this week and worship together and exalt you and Right now, we, we, we need a word from you. We want you to teach us. In your name I pray, amen. Well, good morning. I'm going to move this thing right here. All right. So I'm not Paul. If you're looking for Pastor Paul, he's on vacation. Uh, you know, no, he, he deserves it. You guys work him to death. Um, but yeah. So um, I'm substitute preaching this morning, I guess you could say, and uh, we have been uh, studying in the book of Corinthians, so if you're new with us, it's your first time with us, uh, we've been going verse by verse uh, through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to pick up there again today in, uh, in Corinthians chapter 9, so if you want to go ahead and flip there, and if you're one of those over-eager people, you can just do that and hold your finger there. Uh, before we even jump in, though, I, I need to say this. Uh, I was told to make this, this grand announcement, and it, it's super important. Uh, we have a family ministry banquet coming up August 12th at 6 p.m. Now, if you're looking around and you say, well, you know what? I don't have kids. I don't have teenagers, so that's not for me. You're really wrong about that, okay? So what this is, is this a chance for us uh, to share with you the vision of the different ministries that we have for the family and the church. Um, and on top of that, it's also a time for us to paint a picture for the needs that we have. Um, this isn't something that we hire someone to do, and then they're like the superstar, and they're going to do all the discipling of your children, you know. It's not like that. We want to come alongside of families and partner with them in raising their kids up and discipling their children. And we need people to come and help us do that and invest in kids and invest in children, invest in preschoolers, invest in students. So uh, if that's you and you know, you know what, I've been sitting in a Sunday school class or a life group class for a long time now, and uh, it's time for me to just quit being a sponge and it's time for me to start giving something. Um, I hope that you'll, did I just guilt you enough? Okay, I, I want you to uh, come and, and join in and hear about what God's doing in all these different ministries and I hope maybe you'll find a place to serve in there because uh, one of the worst enemies in a church are those chairs. If all you ever do is come and sit in the audience, then we are not doing the work of the ministry and we're not functioning as the body of Christ. So I hope that you'll get out of that chair and do something among uh, people and invest in people. That was it. You ready? You ready to jump in? So before we jump into Corinthians, I want to share with you uh, a verse that's kind of outside of the box. Um, first of all, I know that when you wake up in the morning, just like I, when I wake up in the morning, no one wakes up and says, today I want to lose right? Today I want to lose. Everyone wants to win in life. Everyone, everyone wants to succeed. There's this God-given desire inside of all of us to live a life with purpose, something that will outlive ourselves, right? And so that's, that's in everybody. Everybody's got that in them. And so the question then is this, what does a winning life look like? Or, or better yet, simpler, what is a win? What does a win look like? So in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, there's a verse, and there's two uh, universal truths that apply to all human beings in this one simple verse, and here's what it says. You ready? It says this, and just as it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. Two truths. You ready? Number one, this is deeply profound. Everyone dies. Can I get an amen? Yeah, Right? I mean, I know, I know that's not something we like to think about, right? Like death, you know, like Reagan, really, you're going to start off today telling me I'm going to die. I woke up this morning, it was beautiful outside. I get to church and then somebody's going to tell me, oh yeah, you're going to die, right? Doesn't sound very encouraging. 
And you know what? No one will disagree with that truth either. Unless they're just completely insane, no one will deny that death is coming. But here's the truth about it. We don't like to live like death is coming, do we? We like to push the issue of death off to the side and pretend like we're never going to be touched by it until someone close to us passes away or until we see some tragedy on TV and it causes us to pause just long enough to acknowledge our mortality, right? And then, and then we push back as quick as we can. We push it back up to the peripheral of our life and we continue to live life like it's not coming. But it is coming. And see, the second truth of this statement is something that we don't have a consensus on. There's a lot of people that believe a lot of things. What happens after you die? I mean, you have people that believe in things like reincarnation. You might come back as a butterfly or a mosquito, depending on how you lived in this life, you know? Or, or maybe, maybe that you're going to experience nirvana. Are you going to go to some version of heaven or paradise or euphoria? Or maybe you get that wonderful task of becoming an angel and you're going to get to float around here on earth and take care of all your needy relatives, right? Or, or maybe, maybe it's just you become worm food. But if you're a believer and you believe the word of God, which is the truth, then we have to believe that what comes after death is that next statement. After that comes judgment. After that comes judgment. Now, if you're, if you're not a believer, you're going to stand before the white throne judgment. That is for people who have rejected Christ. That's the people who rejected that gift of grace, and their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. However, if we're a believer, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is a rewards judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due him for, for what he has done in the body, whether good or are evil. Now you're saying, Reagan, why are we starting this this way this morning? Here's why. Our time is limited. We don't know how much time we have left. I didn't bring that up so that you can mope around and be like, oh no, I'm going to die. You know, like I bring it up this morning because what would it look like if instead of pushing the reality that our time is limited off to the side, what if we brought that reality and set it in front of us? What, what would change in our days, in our priorities, in our relationships, our use of resources, if we realize that our time is limited and that every opportunity, every moment, every relationship has eternal value and significance? What would it look like if we live life with an eternal perspective rather than a temporal one? We have one of two choices. One of two choices. We can either spend our lives or we can invest our lives. We, we can either spend our lives on things that will not last, that will not matter for the kingdom or eternity, or we can invest our lives in what will last forever. Things that will bring glory to our Savior and King. Things that will bring hope and life to people who are lost outside of Christ and will bring eternal rewards for us as we live our lives. So here's what a winning life looks like. It's a person living their life for the life to come. A person who lives this life in light of the life to come. So Paul lived his life this way. Paul, in every way, as, his, as he was discipling and instructing the Corinthian believers, he was instructing them to live life in this way. We last, uh, last week, we went off as Paul continued to teach and demonstrate that personal rights are less important than the proclamation of the gospel of grace. And that the spiritual well-being of people who might hear that proclamation and be forever changed. Over the last weeks, we've seen that as Paul has established that he had the same rights as others to eat and drink, the right to marry, the right to require payment as a pastor, as his service as a pastor. But then he goes on to say, but we bear all things that we may cause no hindrance to the good news of Christ. That's the point. That's the priority of Paul. In fact, he went in chapter 8, he called the Corinthians to give up their personal rights to eat meat that was sacrificed to idols for the sake of the gospel. Paul talks about being under the obligation to proclaim the gospel, and his reward for his faithfulness to that gospel is just to know that I offered this gospel of grace freely and without charge. He declares his motive. He says that while he was a free man, he also made himself a, a bondservant, a slave to all people. He became all things to all people so that by all possible means he might save some. And then he goes and declares his motive 
for this self-denying life, this passionate life of getting the gospel out, and here's what it was. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. You see, everything for Paul was about the glory of God and the souls of men. He lived and breathed to see God worshipped and exalted, to see men redeemed and restored by the power of the gospel of Jesus. It's what he did. It's what he lived for. And anything that came in conflict with that perspective, anything that would hinder that work, he would bring it into perspective. He would encourage the Corinthians to check it and make sure it is not a hindrance, not entangling them so that they did not lose focus of what was most important. So to further illustrate the point, it brings us to the passage of the Corinthians that we're in today. If you'll look in chapter 9, I want to read this to you. You guys still with me this morning? All right. It says this. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. So Paul's going on and he's continuing this message. So he paints this picture using this athletic metaphor. Some of you are like, thank God it's a metaphor, right? (laughs) Praise the Lord. All right. But the metaphor is this. Runners, they live a life of discipline. There's certain disciplines that a runner must practice in their life to make it possible for them to win a race. And in the same way as believers, there are spiritual disciplines and things that we need to have in our lives that make make it possible for us to attain the prize and and the rewards of the kingdom to come. And so scholars, when they've noted the Corinthians, they've noted that they probably hosted the Isthmian Games, which were somewhat of an Olympic-type game. Um, Corinth was located on an isthmus that connected northern and southern Greece. And and so they, they had contests that were like boxing and wrestling and foot races. So this use of this metaphor was very, you know, it, it made sense for Paul to use it because the Corinthians knew what he was talking about, and they also knew what it took to win the race and the discipline it would take to win. So Paul is kind of tailoring this metaphor to them, but it's something we can all relate to. But let's let's look at it kind of bit by bit. It says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. So now when it says only one receives the prize, I don't want you to give too much weight to that phrase because the spiritual prize that Paul's illustrating with this isn't limited to one winner. Uh, Many people will receive rewards when they enter the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, there is a warning in here. Just like there are winners and losers in a race, there's also winners and losers when it comes to spiritual prizes. You know, my worst fear is this, that I would get to heaven and I would be standing behind a guy and I would hear Jesus say to that guy, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little, now you'll be faithful. I'm going to put you in charge over much. Enter my kingdom. And then I step up and he say, hey, Reagan, glad you can make it, right? That, that would be the worst ending to a life, right? Like, I, I wouldn't want that. And, you know, here's the reality. Heaven for the faithful, we have to believe because of the rewards, judgment, and that system that's set up in Scripture, that heaven for the faithful is going to be a little bit better than those who, who spent their life on themselves, who used it for their own glory and not for the glory of God and didn't invest it for the sake of the gospel. Because heaven's all about the glory of God. So in Corinthians, uh, it tells us, you've already studied this in Corinthians chapter 3, it talked about, you know, building on the foundation of Christ. And you could use either gold, silver, costly stones, which have eternal significance, they will last, or wood, hay, or straw, which would be burned up in the fire. And it says you would enter into the kingdom but only as one escaping, basically it translates by the skin of your teeth. You would be tried by fire and you'd barely, you'd get in. You know what? Heaven's better than hell. But I don't think any of us want to enter it in that way, right? Empty handed. Nothing to offer King Jesus. And so here we are. Here's some things that living a winning life we must do. You ready? Number one, determine that the eternal prize is worth investing our entire lives into. We must leverage our time, our talents, our treasure, and our relationships 
all to make much of Jesus and to labor that people would know his love and grace. We got to give it all. And the words of the great philosopher Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first, you're last. We don't enter into this race. We don't, we don't come about this some, with some passive pursuit of Christ. This is not some, you know, little trot. This is, this is not some half-hearted run. This is all-in kind of stuff. Now, Paul, he's not talking about uh, earning our salvation in this passage. The salvation of the audience that he's instructing here is it's already assumed. That state of spiritual life is already assumed. But what he's saying to them is, how now shall you live? In light of the grace you received, in light of the salvation that is yours, for the sake of the name of Jesus, how now will you live your life? Guys, this should be our greatest desire, our greatest passion, our highest honor to give ourselves wholly to Jesus, to make our whole lives about making his name great. You know, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercy, in view of all he's done for us, in view of the sacrifice of him laying his life down, of the salvation received in him, in view of his mercies, all for yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto, unto God. This is your reasonable act of worship. In other words, the only thing that makes sense for us to do in light of the salvation and the grace that we receive, the only thing that makes sense is for us to take our lives and lay them before King Jesus and say, it's all yours. Use me whatever it takes, whatever you want, I'm yours. Can I get amen or an ouch or something? Next, we must grow in our spiritual disciplines and practices through intentional training. It says every athlete exercises self-control in all things. You know, most of the effort required to win a race um, or any contest, it takes place before the day of the race. Any of you guys ever try to get up and run a triathlon, you know, like the day of? You just, hey, I'm going to do that today. How, how far would you get? Anybody? No one? About that much, Right. Maybe not out of the bed. Okay, so winning today requires practicing yesterday and the day before and the day before that. You know, it also requires disciplines of all sorts like our diet or our amount of sleep or studying the competition or developing a strategy. See, the game in which a competitor competes, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Most of the effort lies below the surface. Most of the effort lies out of sight. Let me ask you a question. What disciplines do we need to observe in our spiritual lives to win this race, this spiritual race that we're in? Let me give you a couple. Number one, study a scripture. Scripture is our diet. Scripture is truth. We're having to undo all the patterns of this world that we were born into, all the ways of thinking that we were uh, born into in this world. We have to renew our minds with truth. And so we have to go to the Word of God. And we need word. And you know what? Every time that you go to the Word of God, it's not filet mignon. Sometimes it's peanut butter and jelly, right? But you've got to eat. You've got to have food. You've got to have a diet. And you need to be feeding yourself the Word. And the Word of God, it reveals to us our strategy. It's our knowledge of the opponent. It, it tells us about the heart of people and how to interact with people and relate to people. It, it shows us the power and the will of God. It, it shows us the promises of God that we anchor our lives on as we go about in this race. You have to take in the word of God. You have to study the scripture. Let me tell you, if you find yourself losing in the race, if you find yourself falling back in the race or even on the sideline and not even in the race, chances are you are spiritually starving yourself. Churches are full of malnutritioned Christians. They're not feeding themselves the word of God. They're trying to survive from Sunday to Sunday. And it's not sufficient of a diet. It won't work. God wants you to draw near to him yourself, to have an intimate relationship with him yourself. He wants to talk to you, believe it or not. And you know what? On top of that, we have a coach. His, you know, God is our coach in this race, and he's trying to instruct us on how to go about life. He's trying to tell us how to navigate relationships, how to go around pitfalls, what path to take, all of those beautiful things that he is perfectly knowledgeable of. And our spiritual vocabulary with which he interacts with us is the word of God. 
But a lot of us, all God can do is talk to us like spiritual infants still. Right? He's still there going, uh, John 3, 16. And you know what? As beautiful as that verse is, and that one that you put in yourself a long time ago, that's great. But you know what? When it comes to certain things in life, that might not be what he needs to talk to you about. But you'll never recall a verse that you haven't read. That's genius, right? (laughs) You've got to put the word of God in you. So that when you're going about this life and in this race, the Holy Spirit has something to guide you with, to teach you with, to speak to you about. You've got to enter into God's word and let it enter into you. Next, we have to also have an extraordinary prayer life. How often are we in conversation with God? Is that a buffer between supper time and and bedtime? Is, is, it, is it just something that we do and just in public gathering moments? Or do we practice prayer? Are we practicing abiding in the spirit? Uh, I, I'll go ahead and tell you this. Our effectiveness and gospel proclamation will be in direct proportion to our prayer lives. We will never see a gospel movement until we see a prayer movement among God's people. Our prayer lives reveal what we believe about the power and greatness of God and our dependency on Him. It also reveals what we believe about our faith and trust in our own power and ingenuity and talents and ideas. Prayer is essential. We know the rest of the list. You know, worship, personal worship is a discipline. Giving is a spiritual discipline. All of these things that we should be practicing. And then there's practices. Jesus went on to emphasize feeding the hungry, giving the thirsty something to drink, uh, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, taking care of the sick, taking care of orphans and widows, and visiting the prisoner. Now I'll go ahead and say, few Christians do all of these things, and none of, this, none of us do them perfectly. However, we, it, we need these spiritual disciplines because they bring us closer to God, closer to becoming the people God created us to be. And it makes us better fit for the race, better fit for the kingdom. And by then, we're able to run with endurance and faithfulness. If you're not running the race, you have only yourself to blame. We must make the effort to be discipled, trained, sharpened, and to grow. And I'm going to tell you this. This is the beautiful thing of the church. This is like your spiritual gym. This is your family. And you can come here and you need to find people who have been walking with Jesus a little bit longer than you and ask them, will you pour into me? Will you help me grow? Will you teach me? I want to follow you around. I'm going to bug you a lot. You can do that here, okay? This is a place to grow in that way. Number next, okay? It says this. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. We need not be distracted by temporary and earthly pursuits. Don't be distracted by temporary and earthly pursuits. You know, today there's trophies, there's Super Bowl rings, there's Oscar awards, all these things, and they we, where we acknowledge the, the big winners. You know, in each of those little prizes, they have some monetary value, but where the real value lies is the statement that those prizes make of the one possessing the prize, right? It says to us, they are the best of the best. And look, we all like acclaim, don't we? We do. We all have, we're all overcoming this deep-rooted addiction to ourselves. And, and God is doing that. We've been set free in Christ, and the Holy Spirit is patiently, and I mean patiently, working that out in us, isn't he? But we also have hearts that are so easily distracted. We have hearts that are like idol-making factories, it's been said. And, and so Satan, he knows that about us. So he plays to both of those things to take our eyes off of the prize, to take us out of the race, to consume our lives with the pursuit of temporary pleasures and satisfaction and pseudo means of contentment and happiness. And look, he'll gladly deliver to you popularity if you're willing to give up the mission of Jesus. He will gladly bless you with tons of money if it would mean keeping your heart more invested in your business than in the kingdom of God and people. He will gladly help align achievements for you if it meant that that stage would be used to proclaim your greatness rather than to leverage it for the greatness of Jesus and to put the spotlight on him. Man, Satan will go along with that all day long. You know, 
I was uh, one time had the, uh, I don't know if you call it a privilege, but I, I went to the American Music Awards. Anybody ever seen that on TV, right? And uh, my, my friend uh, Mark Hall, if you guys know the band Casting Crowns, they've been up for that award several times. And one, one time his wife didn't want to go. And uh, he said, do you want to go? I'm like, sure, I'll go, right? So uh, I went to the American Music Awards. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really awkward because I'm walking the red carpet, you know, with everybody. And I'm like, I, I'm not a part of this. You know, like, so <laughs> it was odd. Um, I did see Flava Flav, so dream accomplished, right? Um, but... But we, we get in there, and we're all sitting there during the show. And, you know, all these celebrities, you know, I mean, there's everyone, there's anyone in, in Hollywood and all, they're all there. And, uh, you know, I remember, like, uh, watching, uh, I think at the time, NSYNC was, like, one of the bands, you know, like, shut up. I just dated myself. All right. So he, they come in, you know, and then you had, like, Guns N' Roses over here. Wow. You know, then you had, like, all these different, like, icons of music sitting around. And I remember, I remember um, at the time, uh, she was really popular. I don't know where she's gone now, but about two rows in front of me, like two heads in front of me was Paris Hilton, right? And uh, so we're all watching the show, and then they go to a commercial break. And it was really odd because, you know, while it was happening, everyone's all smiles and, ah, they're laughing at every joke, you know. And then the commercial break. And then everyone in the room would just be like, Except for Paris, she was like, <laughs> and, and I, I'm watching that happen through the evening. I'm like, you know what? This is as good as it gets for them. This is the moment they live for. And yet in this moment, they have nothing. I, I felt for like Paris Hilton. I'm thinking she knows that the only way she has any value in her mind, it's her face. She knows they're going to do 100 zoom-ins on her during this show. And so every time when the commercial break, she had to make sure she was perfect. And I just thought to myself, wow, what a tragedy it would be if we live our lives for such temporal, meaningless, empty things. And you know, a lot of times we as Christians, we live our lives like this is a cruise ship instead of a sinking ship. We're trying to make paradise happen right here on this earth. And my friends, I can tell you, it's not going to work. It's broken. We live for a kingdom yet to come. We can't get distracted. We need to grow in grace. We need to let go of our idols. We need to grow in our identity as citizens of the kingdom of God. We need to run this race. We don't need to run the race the world tells us to run and then give the leftovers to the kingdom. That is a wasted life. But as a disciple of Christ, we run for the life yet to come. Next, so I do not run aimlessly, it says. We need to know the, tr the path and the goal is Jesus. The path and the goal is Jesus. The aim is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And my friends, listen, we do not invent our own race. We don't come up with this. It's already been marked out for us. Look in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says this. Therefore, we are since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, this marked out before us, looking to Jesus the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. We're kind of like in a baton passing relay race. That's what it's like. And there's this great cloud of witnesses, and they've run their part of the race, and now they're in heaven, and they're cheering us on like, run. Run for the name of Jesus. Run for the glory of God. Run for the gospel. That's what he's they're telling us to do. It says Jesus has already endured the cross. That was his joy to do that for you. Now run this race. It's been marked out for you. You know what, though? The reality is a lot of us do invent our own race. A lot of us are marking out our own race. And you want me to tell you, we run aimlessly when we do that. We're chasing happy usually, aren't we? Did you know happy is an emotion, right? How many of you guys have already been through like 10 moods already this morning? Anybody? You know what I mean? 
You woke up like, I hate the world. And then like, you know, the car ride here, you know, like your, maybe wrath came out. And then by the time you got here, you know, the grace of God was upon you. And you stepped out of that magic car into the magic church parking lot. You know how it works, right? Like you're ripping your kid's head off. Then you get out of the car and then you're like, bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Right? <laughs> Glory to God. Right? Right? Happy is an emotion and people chase it. And I'll tell you about happy. You know, we're usually trying to answer that question. How can I get happy? Who's going to make me happy? When will I get happy? What's going to make me happy? And it's a deceiving thing. Because what happens is you, you get happy for a little bit, and then the mood changes, and you try to get happy again, and you try to get happy again. And eventually, somewhere in life, a new question starts rising up, and it's the right question. And it's the question of why. Why this job? Why this career? Why this marriage? Why, you know, these kids, you don't get a choice. But why? And that's a question of purpose. Because God created you with purpose. And, and Paul knew the why answer. The why was Jesus. It was all about Jesus. Everything was about Jesus. It was about the glory of God. In the pursuit of him. That's our prize. That's our race. And then he says this. I do not box as one beating the air. We must have a set strategy for winning. Paul was not shadow boxing his way through life. He wasn't swinging wildly just hoping something would have effect. Paul was following the command, the call, the method, and the model of Jesus, his leader. In Matthew 28, we know the, we know the commission. We know the strategy. We know what we're supposed to be doing. Go, therefore, into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always to the end of the age. That's the strategy. That's what Christ said we're supposed to set our feet to every day that we wake up. Every day we are blessed with the gift of oxygen in our lungs. We are supposed to leverage that day for the glory of God to make disciples and get the gospel to those who don't know him. Listen, for you who do know Christ, my brothers and sisters in this room, on your worst day, you get heaven. But those who are outside of Christ, On their best day, they're at the doorsteps of hell. And the question we do have to ask ourselves, those who proclaim that we know the grace of Christ and we've received this gift of grace and amazing love, we have to ask ourselves, how much do we hate someone to not tell them about the good news of Christ and salvation? How much do you really have to despise people to keep such a wonderful piece of news to ourselves? This is the mission. We are to go and make disciples. We're also to know the enemy. Paul knew the enemy. He went, he went in the air box and he knew who he was, who he was up against. Guys, we are not fighting against people. Practically many times as the church, it looks like we think we are. We are fighting for people. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of this dark age. We are in a spiritual battle for the souls of men. And we must not lose perspective. But, he says, he goes on and says, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. The next blank is this, control the flesh. We must control the flesh by submitting to the control of the Holy Spirit. Paul was human. He knew that in his own power, and his own strength, there is no way in this world he could win the race on his own. There is no way he could do it on his own. So he, would, he refused to allow his fleshly desires, his pride, all of those things that war inside of us, he refused to let that rule him. His battle became daily what our battle is, and that is to put ourselves on the altar and to submit ourselves to the leadership, to the power, and to the rule of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul understood that, walking in the Spirit every day, deeply trusting and fully obedient as he led the race. That's where victory lies, over our flesh. And the same is true for us. Let me ask you a question. Are there any arenas of your life today where you would say, you know what, I'm doing okay on my own? 
in that part of my life? Is there any areas of our lives where there's arrogance in us where we would say, I've got this? Because I would say to you immediately that the Holy Spirit of God is putting his finger on exactly that, saying, give that to me right now. Because if you don't, it will entangle you and trip you up in this race, and you will be rendered ineffective for the glory of God. And people are at stake, and God is jealous that people would know his name. And the last point is this. Paul says this. He says, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. We must not live for our own glory and name, but for the glory and the name of King Jesus. You see, Paul knew this. If I go around and I proclaim Jesus' name, and I go around and do this great ministry and all these lives are changed and, and people, you know, they're, they're, they're born again and people are being saved and their eternal destiny is being redirected. And if I do all of that and I'm faithful to this and I give myself fully to it, but I don't do it with a heart of authentic worship. I don't do it with a pure motive of really for the glory of God. If I do it for me, if I do it for my name's sake, then at the end of this race, there is no reward for that. There is no joy in that. Let me tell you why. God created us. He created the human heart to worship, not to be worshiped. In fact, when the human heart is worshiped, whether you worship your own self or you're receiving worship from other people, ultimately it will lead you to a place of utter despair because your heart wasn't created with the capacity to receive that. Your heart was created to worship, and we all worship something. And so when we make our lives about the worship of King Jesus, the only one that is worthy of all honor and glory and praise and might and power, the only one that we should ascribe any, any touch of glory to, your life, that is your reward. You will find great reward, great pleasure, great joy and invest in your life for his name's sake. Can I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning? Just as we have a time of reflection and prayer, I'm just kind of not looking around. If just for a moment, you can kind of, kind of not acknowledge anyone else around you. Just kind of you in a Jesus moment right here. Paul was determined to live a life with eternal value and perspective. You see, he lived his life for the life to come, and he kept that in front of him. So every day for Paul, he made it count. In fact, this is the way he ends his journey, one of his last letters that he wrote. He, he wrote this. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Can I ask you this morning a question? Are you spending your life on yourself? Or are you investing your life on what's going to last forever? God and people. Those are the only two things that have eternal value and significance. What you do to invest in those two, that's what matters. Maybe today you've been running the race and somewhere along the way you got knocked down. You got distracted. And when you fell down and you Maybe you, you feel like, man, I royally messed up, and man, the opponent, the enemy was right there in your ear, and he's just telling you, you've gone too far this time. You're out. The race for you is over. And you've let those words and that enemy cripple you with that lie. Today, my prayer for you is that you would be of great courage, that you would be encouraged by the reality that Jesus is the victor. Jesus runs this race with you, And in Christ Jesus, we are led in triumphal procession. So maybe today it might be a chance for you where the altar is open. I would ask that maybe you would come down and just maybe lay 
down that burden before the Lord, that lie that you've been believing about yourself before the Lord, and remind Satan that greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And that you would get back in the race. Maybe for you today, you don't know the Lord Jesus. And so you're just trying to chase happy. You're just trying to make life make sense. Maybe you're just trying to survive life. Get up, go to work, eat a meal, go to bed. And you think, man, that's all there is. That is a lie too. You see, you were created as a child of God. Sin came into the world and and when it did, it broke everything and it broke our connection, our relationship with God. But your heavenly father has lovingly pursued you to the point of that he gave his only son to die, his perfect son, to die, to take the punishment that we all deserve because of our sin so that we could be restored to right relationship with him. Jesus wants you to know him. He wants you to be reconnected to the heavenly father, to have a relationship, to be restored to that right relationship. Not because you're going to get good, but because he's good. Not because you're anything, but because he is full of love and mercy and grace. And he does have a purpose for you. He's put you in this world to radiate light for him, to run a race that would make much of him. And he's inviting you to come with him and to follow him into that race and to a real life of purpose, one that has an eternal value to it. So maybe today you're tired of giving yourself to empty things, empty pursuits, and you would say, hey, today I'm laying that junk down. I want a real life. I want to know Jesus. I need to be forgiven. I want to start over. And if that's you, I and a couple of pastors will be down here at the front. Man, come down. Take one of us by the hand and just say, I want to know Jesus. That's all you got to say. And, and we'll, we'll have a conversation and we'll talk through what that means. Believers, there's someone that God has put in your life that doesn't know Christ. Are you aware of them? Do you know them? Could you call their name out even to heaven right now and pray on their behalf? Like I said, we'll never proclaim the gospel if we don't pray first. This is the, way, the way I tell the students is this, you'll never talk to your friends about Jesus until you talk to Jesus about your friends. So maybe today you need to come down to the altar and in some serious prayer, say, oh God, I'm calling this name out to you. Will you use me to proclaim the good news and the good name of Jesus to them patiently, humbly, with wisdom, but may I not use any more excuses. May I get in the race and do what I'm called to do. Lord Jesus, I pray right now in this moment of invitation that you would have your way in our hearts. And really, Lord, what matters most is not what just happens right here in this moment. What happens tomorrow morning when we wake up and the next day and the next day, that's where our mission is. That's where the battle is. I pray, Lord, that we would run the race with endurance, that you would be our strength, you would be our guide, you would be our wisdom, you would be our power, you would be our love for people. Lord, may we pursue you And may from the overflow of that, I pray that we would run a life that counts. And may we have a winning life in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.